Good morning, y'all. It's good to be. <laughs> it's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to be the house of the Lord. Um, my name is Otto Javier Lemus Pineda, but everybody calls me OJ, uh, and it's truly a privilege to be here together. Let me give you a little background. Uh, we're from Guatemala with my wife, uh, and when we arrived to College Station, uh, we were coming from around 10 years of serving in a local church. Uh, I was a mission pastor, and we together were uh, youth pastors back in Guatemala, and we loved serving the Lord. By the time we were serving, one of our prayers was, we want to learn more to do better. Because in Guatemala, there's a lot of need, but you usually do things in a very organic way. Well, I was going to preach only on the Spanish uh, service, and last minute, I know I'm going to preach in English. So that's a way to stretch, right? That's a way to stretch. Uh, I remember when I was young and we were doing missionary work. Uh, we were starting, and there was a desire to do uh, as much as we could. And so we were in a very needy area of Guatemala, and we put a team together, uh, and, and we were serving with some of our youth and I told to one of my friends, hey, can you prepare the, child, the children's lesson and can you uh, share the word with the, with the children? And he was very excited. He was coming from uh, a difficult time and he has been learning uh, through some of the uh, stages of his life. And he was, he was very honored. And then uh, we were finishing uh, our, our worship songs, and the kids were very excited. And we were like, okay, it's time to learn the Bible. And as we were going through the, through the message, uh, I was like, well, he's doing great, you know. Uh, he's, we kind of prepared the word together, and we were uh, studying it. Uh, and, and then he was on the peak of his message. And he said, kids, niños, we need to receive Christ in our hearts. And I was like, yes, finish it, finish it, you know. And then he said, because that God died stuff for us in the cross. And I was like, hold on, that doesn't make much sense. I mean, it's some true, but that's not the way the Bible says. I'm telling this message, uh, I'm telling this story, because much time we assume things that are in the Bible, and we teach things that are not in the Bible. We are in our week of theologies, and we're going to be studying about Bibleology or Bibliologia. And I want to ask you something. Have you ever shared or said something that you have as a truth or you have the certainty that is on the Bible? And let's go through some of these ones. Is this in the Bible? God help those who help themselves. It's in the Bible? Who said it? Benjamin Franklin, right? But I have heard others, you know, like encourage others. Come on, you can do it. The Bible says God help those who help themselves. Uh, others, money is the root of all evil. Well, we have heard this, but the reality is the love of money, according to 1 Timothy. Spare the rod and spoil the child. Well, the Bible says, he who spares the rod hates his son. That's in Proverbs. So, another one is, God will never give you more that you can handle. I have heard this one so many times in so many countries, believe me, but says, he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. So, how do such misconceptions become so easily misattributed to the Bible? Well, it's, it's very tragic, but people, even us, Christians, are way too unfamiliar with God's Word. And it's very important to know its contents and what it says so we can minister to others. I want you to focus on this. This is our main idea for today. You and I, we have been given the world's greatest treasure. Amen? It's the God-love-driven revelation of himself. It is life-changing, and it's altogether true. We are most blessed when we value it for what it is. That's the Bible. The Bible, it's the way 
that we have to know about God. We were in one, in one meeting, um, and, and, and one of uh, the pastors was saying, I don't know any other way to know God but what the Bible says. I, I, I didn't know about, I mean, I, I didn't walk with Jesus. I was not in the time of the prophets. So the only way for me to know God and the promises and the love of the Father for me is through the Bible. But sometimes we just take it for granted. So having this in, in, in our mind, we're going to study about bibliology. Uh, and this is, this is the first of our theologies. Of, uh, and so we're going to study about bibliology. Bibliology comes from uh, biblos, which means books, and then uh, ology, which is the study. So by logic, is the study of the book. <laughs> when we see about this, it's very easy to uh, just make it very mechanical, you know. But our call is not just to read this book, but it's to love it and embrace it and to live our life according to what it says. So we're going to study a little bit more. Definition of the study of the scriptures, of the scriptures uh, is as God revelation of himself and is the inspiration of them. We're going to read together. And I want to invite you to all of us read together uh, this, this passage of the, of, the, of, the, of the Bible. If we all can uh, read it together uh, as, as church, that will be great. Are you ready? Three, two, one. All the scripture, give him inspiration, and it's profitable for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, truly equipped. Amen. So think about those words that are underlined. It's God inspired, it's profitable, make us complete and equip truly. That word I had to practice three times. For every good work, that's, that's what we are being equipped. That's why we have the Bible. That's why we come and we study and we learn in the sermons. Every time we come to church, we're being equipped. Think about something. How many of us, and I'm talking to the guys right now, and to, the, to our, our sisters too, how many of us wrote love, uh, letters of love or love letters to when we were trying to conquer the person that now is our wife, husband, boyfriend? How many of us get inspiration? Yeah, I, I see some hands, some hands over there. How many of us, you know, uh, we, we get inspiration and then we start that thing, you know, and we think about it, we erase one day we were doing a mission trip with Nere, uh, well, not Nere, we were a team, and then it was very isolated. To get to that place, uh, Nere sent me a letter, and it has to go, I'm not lying, through an uh, eight, eight hour trip from a bus station to another place, and then it had to go to a cattle uh, truck, and someone has to take it on, and then they have to hike for eight hours to arrive to the village where we were doing missions, and I got a letter from Nere. We were dating. We were not, and so when I got that letter, I was like walking everywhere, you know, and I was so excited, and people were looking at me like, what's happening, you know? The Lord, God, our God, brought us a love letter. It's up to us how we're going to cherish and love what the Lord has brought for us. Think about it. If you got a, a call right now from the former president of the United States or the president of the United States, would you not take that phone call? Oh, I'm pretty sure a lot of people will be like going and then some other will be like, what's he saying, what's he saying, right? Because we want to get to know important people. Well, God, the most important thing uh, being in our life, he has brought us his word. Well, let's continue. And as we embark on the study of uh, bibliology, we need to ask, if theology is essentially the study of God, what possible sources exist from which can go in this study? 
God pre-exists every author that we have in the Bible. Every information that we can get about himself, we can only see what he has and what he desires for us. And there's two ways that we can see this. God self-revealed himself because he longs for us to know him. He wants for us to know him. He, he is longing for that moment that we can get to know him. And so there's two ways that he has done this. One is through general revelation. When we talk about general revelation, um, we, we can think on everything that we have on the nature, everything that we see everywhere. Um, Romans 1, 19 and 20 says, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Often, I like to drive to Harvey Mitchell, not at 5 p.m., no, 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 but when it's either sunrise or sunset. I really enjoy that drive. Not the traffic, but, this, but, but just contemplate the wonders of God's creation. Have you ever stopped and said, wow, Lord, you are incredible. How did you create all this? The general revelation can be defined as God's witness of his own existence in more general ways and through natural forms. Well, but there's different ways that we can um, see this, or there's different means. Uh, and, and we already talked about the creation. He, in the creation, everything that we see declares the glory of God, declares who he is. Through the history is another, another, another thing that we can see. When he, from one man, he created all the nations as Acts and Jude, Judge and Ruth says, and the mankind, when even Gentiles who do not have God written law show that they know his love when they instantly obey it. So there is a light that dictates for humanity how to live. But this is general revelation, it's for everyone. The conscience. When you are seeing what your brother or sister is doing, and then you're quick to judge, and you say, oh, I see what you're doing, but you do the same thing at the next day or at the, set, say, at the, at the next minute. And so those things, sorry, those things can be seen as part of the general revelation. Some of the purposes of why the general revelation is given to us is because reveals reveals the existence and the greatness of God. And Romans 1.20 says, Forever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. So everyone has seen how great our God is. The other topic is, He reveals men's accountability to God. When you condemn others, you are becoming your same, yourself accountable to act upon what you're saying. If I said to my wife, you can't do this, A, B, C, I have to make sure I don't do A, B, C as well. And, and that's, that's something that is it's, it's in us. But the general revelation doesn't save. And you will say, like, how? I mean, why doesn't save? I mean, we're seeing God, yeah. But the general revelation doesn't save. God's plan of salvation can we cannot be known through it. Romans 10, chapter 10, verse 13 to 15 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have not heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells him. And that's why it's really important. 
that we go to everyone who is around us. That's why our church exists. That's why it has been planted. We have started here, and, and we have great people that are serving, and you are coming here. But it's not only for us to be sitting on our chairs. When we come and we learn about what the Lord is doing here, and when we learn the Bible, we must go to others. As Pastor Carla says, you are one of the, you are the living Bible to others. And you can see it, we all can see it everywhere. As you go to your workplace, to your family, people will say, well, you have something different. What it is? People want to know you because they want to know God. And you represent him. But we need to be very, very, and I forget the word, but it's very, uh, you have to act. You have to move. You have to go. You have to be willing. There's going to be nervous. You're going to be nervous. You're not going to be maybe feeling prepared, but the Lord is with us. And if he's with us, we can go. So, this moves. I'm getting excited, sorry. <laughs> okay. So, another purpose of the general revelation is that doesn't help us know God's character and personality. It's different when you see someone, but to when you interact with that person. Have you judged someone by appearance? Have you said, oh, that person, he looks so mad, and he's the sweetest teddy bear ever. So, verse 23 of Acts says, For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, on it to an unknown God. And this is part of the story where we see in the Bible that the Lord had a place that people didn't know him. So, that's the general revelation. But true, special revelation, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in, this, in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worse, the worlds. The special revelation will allow us to get to know the salvation plan and our purpose. It will identify us with what God has for us. We can see various means of this, this self-revelation, how God and then the special revelation show to us. One is through history. Uh, the other one is to uh, Theophanes, which is basically when the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give you this land through angels, through dreams. Another way is casting lots. Remember when they were casting lots? And then uh, Matthias, 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 was selected to become an apostle with the other 11. They asked the Lord first, and then they cast lots to prophets, through Jesus Christ, and through the scriptures, the written word of God. But, well, before going to this, the purposes of the special revelations are to reveal God's plan to mankind, are to bring sinners to salvations and into a personal relationship with God to reveal mankind moral responsibility through God and to reveal God's character, personality, and its attributes to the people. He wants for us to know him, and he always had a plan. And he had it on the Bible so we can follow it and we can get to know him deeply. Our call is not to have a shallow relationship with him. And that's why I started with may maybe f phrases or words that we know because so many times we have a shallow relationship with the Lord. 
But think about it. Those who are married, those who have their parents, those who, us who are in a family, all of us who have friends, we don't want shallow relationships. I don't want a marriage that just appear to, get, to be good. But when my wife has a need, I don't know what's going on in her heart. I love, and you and you probably see this too, I love when she's thinking on something and I say, hey, you want Chick-fil-A, right? And she will say, yes, how do you know? You know? Well, we've been spending 10 years together, five years married. I mean, it's easy to know my wife because we have a deep relationship. Grill, please, she says. <laughs> so, let's go to this, because this is where this part of the theology concerned to us. The key special revelation that God gave us, his inspired word. So, inspiration comes from the Greek Theophnestus literally means God breathed. And I was preparing my message, and while I was reading this, I was doing this, you know? And Neta was, my wife was looking at me, and she was like, what's going on with you? So can we all do this? Like, yeah. And she's like, why are you doing this? You know, like, it's not breath check. No, no, no. It's because the Lord, when he inspired the word, it was coming from, from his bread. He bred from, when you think about this, your bread is coming from the deep, deep of your, of your, of your body. And so the source of his inspiration is God. This comes from our early key passage when all scripture is inspired by God. God breathed out the Holy Scripture. They come from his innermost being. And this means that God worked through the authors of of scriptures in such a way that the words themselves were inspired. I hope you're following me. The means of God, the way he accomplished inspiration was via human authors. In their word and own styles and personalities, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. Do we believe this? But holy men of God spoke as they were, moved by the Holy Spirit. Think about when the wind moves a boat. That's the way it happened. So, Moses, some of the authors, Moses, he wrote as a statesman. If you read everything, he wrote as a statesman. The Old Old Testament prophets express different characteristics and personalities. Matthew, a a tax collector, talks about money a lot. And then Luke, Paul's companion, records more about Paul than the other apostles. And he was a physician, so he has a unique perspective of the body of Christ. John, a fisherman, writes with simplicity, but Paul writes as a trained expert in rhetoric. So, when we see this, this is something that the Lord is inspiring the word, and he's inspiring the authors to write everything that is in the Bible. He brings unique perspective to each one of them so we can understand, and it's for everyone. Something that we need to to have is the extent of his inspiration. Inspiration, or inspire, is the most common and historic descriptor for the Bible. But non-Orthodox theologians have commanded in the term and severed it from the original message. Their practice of using our vocabulary, but not our dictionary, left a doctrine of inspiration. Let me, let me talk about inspiration. The Lord inspired the word. The Lord brought this, but 
different authors have taken the task of weakening this so there can be confusion. And that's probably why you will hear some people wondering why there's so many different versions of the Bible, why there are um, so many things that we uh, see in different versions. But it's important to always point that the Word was inspired from God. And the original manuscripts, and it's something that we will see later, and also in the, in the second part of our message of Ibnology next week, the Bible was fully inspired from the Lord. And that's why we believe it's true. When we see the extent of his inspiration, we see that the efforts of the inspiration or the way that the Lord inspired everything, it was, it was in different ways, like, such as natural. This, this is some of the ways that um, the people try to describe how the word was inspired by God. So people said that it was in a natural way. The writers were geniuses, but not inspired by God. They were saying, well, they study a lot. They have a lot of knowledge. And so they knew what they were writing. This was not inspired by God. This is not true. Mystical. The writers had a super encounter and brought in a trance-like state. That's one of the beliefs. Partial. Only some part of the scriptures are inspired, while others are not. Concepts. Only the others' concepts and ideas were inspired, but not their words. And another one, neo-orthodox. The writers were spiritually enlightened, but not directly influenced by God. And one that calls my attention, mechanical. It said that God dictated the words while the writers recorded without expressing personality. But an evangelical or orthodox way to understand this is different. Expressing that the fullness and the totality of God's inspiration is coming from the Lord. This view is known as verbal plenary which means that the full text, including the words, are inspired. Verbal means the words, not just the outers or the sentiments behind the words. They are inspired. And plenary means that the words of the scripture, not just a subset, literally each word of the Bible is fully inspired by God. So where did this put us as a church? It's important to know what our church believes. It's important to know what's our stance. Do we fully believe that the Bible is inspired by the Lord? We do believe that. And if you see the constitution of grace, you will see that we believe the inspiration to be defined as God superintending humans' authors so that using their own individual personalities, they compose and record his revelation to men without error in worlds of the original manuscripts. And I want to make a pause there. Because the inspiration or inspire has historically functioned as a catchable term for the Bible as God's word. But watering down, watering down of the terms through the years, as we noted, has caused it to become less descriptive, the Bible's accuracy. Truthfulness and authority. And so, in recent, in recent uh, years, other terms are used. And to reestablish the important characteristics of the Bible, we have different terms such as infallibility and inerrancy. This means that infallibility affirms that the Bible has neither the quality of misleading or being misled, which safeguards that Scripture is a sure, safe, and reliable guide in all matters of faith and practice. As the meaning of the word Inspiration was made less clear by critics 
infallibility became more frequently used to convey that the word of God accomplishes all it intends and is capable, incapable of error or truth. In history, this term, infallibility, was being diluted by some authors. And that's when we see another term coming and it's a little more forceful and unambiguous. The term, the term that began to start using was inerrancy. Inerrancy asserts that the original manuscripts were without error, real or perceived. It applies to the entire Bible. So every word is clarified by inerrancy and clarifies that the original manuscripts that the Bible has contain no errors. Why is it important to understand this? Believe me, coming from Guatemala and then understanding all this, it is really, really important because there's so much confusion around. There's so many uh, people that will rely more in something that they see, especially today in social media, than what the Bible says. Someone asked me, how do I know what, you, what this preacher is saying or what this other preacher is saying is true? How do we know? We go to the Bible. And if what you're hearing is not in the Bible, then it's not true. And it's human content. So that's why it's important to understand all this and to understand that the Word has authority. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, I, was, I, I always hear about the authority of the Word, of the Word of God, of the Bible. And you have to grow a little bit to understand that if you follow everything that is in the Bible, if you live according to the Bible, your life will be completely different your life will change forever. The authority says that as God love-driven self-revelation to man, the Bible comes with binding authority. From how to live the Christian life to doctrines we embrace to how the church orders itself, Scripture is an authoritative word wherein to find that the Holy Spirit enable us in what the Word requires us to obey. Matthew 7, 24, 27. Therefore, everyone who hears this word of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. We even had songs about this. Why? Because it's important to, be, to know that building our life in the foundation that is the Bible will make our life completely different. It will change not only our lives, it will change the life of those who surround us. It will change the lives of those who are uh, coming to us, needy of the Lord. And needy is probably a strong word, but you know what I'm saying. I, they, they, are, they are wondering what's their purpose in life, and we have the answer. It's the word. It's not a nice post on Instagram or Facebook that you share. It's what's in the Word, what can change everybody's life. Going back to this, sorry, sufficiency. And this is something that we often, that we often, often forget, especially in today's world, where there's so many good authors, where there's many so, uh, book writers. We tend to forget that the sufficiency of the word, it's enough for us as a Christian to be equipped and to be adequate for every good work. The Bible is enough. Yes, we can go to other books, we can learn from this fa famous uh, writer, but always go to the Bible and always say, is this on the Bible? Because even if it sounds too good, if it's not on his word, Eh, we need to check and make sure. 
So, going back to the beginning. This is a reminder. You and I have been given the world's greatest treasure. God's love-driven world. Sorry, God's love-driven revelation of himself in his life-changing and altogether true. We're most blessed when we value it for what it is. So, let me ask you something. Are we loving our Bible? Or is something that we go whenever we remember about it? I mean, I don't need to remember that I need to eat three times a day, right? You don't need to remember that. Your body asks you for that. But our spirit might be starving because we are not feeding it constantly with the word. Are we using the Bible just for our benefit? Are we applying some verses? Or are we applying and we are believing what the word says? Because something that I love about studying, about um, you know, going deep in theology, is that there's really easy ways to love the Bible. This is not something that you have to be scared of or that you have to wait for uh, a deep study to come. We can love the Bible in different and easy ways. One is to meditate devotionally. You just don't read the Bible, one verse, you know, you open and then you pick one verse and then, all right, um, you just chose that verse and it's perfect. It's in Spanish, so that's why I didn't read it. (laughs) You just don't pick anything, okay, and that's it. No, 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 you read through it and then you meditate what the Lord wants to tell you. You study deeply. You read, you learn, you self-study, and you memorize. How many of us were lacking of discipleship and we're lacking of knowing the Word? I hope nobody hears go to Bible uh, classes and says, uh, for kids and says, God was stabbing the cross for us. We need to study the Bible. We need to memorize it. We need to, we need to love it. And we need to worship Him passionately for and through it. Well, love sounds great. How do we live it? How do we show it to others? We pray it over yourself and in others. You teach it to others. What you learn, you can teach it to others right away. You lead using it, and then you obey its commandments. Now, This is a lot of concepts. This is a lot of information. And sometimes I I like practical applications. I like how can we apply this? I just know this. When the Lord called us three years ago and we had a prayer, uh, Lord, we want to learn more, to do more. Well, we came and we... We just start living life. We left ministry. And then one day, driving to Harvey Mitchell in the traffic, I remember I said, Lord, we really want to serve you. While we were in Guatemala, I had a heart surgery. And the Lord gave me one verse before going to my surgery. It was on Psalm 138, verse 7 and 8. And I just remember that the Lord promised us that he was going to be with us every day for the rest of our lives. And he was not going to forget the works that he has done in our lives. So let me ask you something. How are you living the Bible? How are you applying the Bible? What are others seeing when they see you? Are they seeing some partial truths? Or are you going to the Bible all the time so you can feed yourself to give others? Because the world needs Jesus. The world needs to know him. It's desperate. And we have the answer that they need. We have the word. 
are we willing to feed others? Before we, we close this time, I want to invite you to read Psalm 19, verses 7 to 11. 7 to 12, sorry. And why don't we all we read it together? I want to invite you to do something as a reverence to the Word. We were in a sobremesa group, and we were reading the Bible. Some of us very comfortable. And then I saw one of our brothers doing this, standing up and reading the Word. That's the way we should, with reverence. So can we all stand up? And can we read together this? And again, we do it in three, two, one. The instruction of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The love even the finest call, they are sweeter than honey and honey dripping to come. They are a warning in your service and a great reward for those who obey them. How can I always Let's pray. Father, as we are coming together to study more deeply about you, about your word, about the Bible, Father, we just don't want to know. We want to be able to live and to shine your word. Thank you, Father, for our church and for the opportunity we have to learn about just who you are, Father. We love you, Jesus. Amen.